Revolutionary Greetings, Hockey Quitty Shakur, coming at you again, moving on to my next topic, and this topic is, you know, what it's all about, what we all strive for as new African people, black people, whatever label, whatever nationality, whatever belief you believe in, but we all know that is only one goal and that's to get free and when you get free that's liberation and there's you know only basically one thing that you know determines a free people and what determines a free people and independent people is the struggle for land Land is the basis of an independent people. Period. That's the, that's the only thing we fight for, man. Land. And this fight for land has been going on for, you know, as far as new African people here in North America, you know, damn near 500 years, man. Well, I ain't gonna say 500 years. I'm, I'm gonna say more like 300 years based on a you know, the struggle of black people here in North America, which is new African people here in North America. 300 years we've been fighting, you know, to liberate the black nation here. That's within the empire of the United States government, man. And, you know, America. And we have evidence. We have great men, great ancestors, great women, great ancestors who, who who laid that path for the new African nation and these people that I'm talking about here today you know are some people that I really want y'all to go study and look up because we know who Marcus Garvey is we know he's the father of you know what we call nation building we know he's the father of the red black and green we know that but he's not the only one. There's plenty more that you need to study that came before him, you know, and you know, cats who was putting it down while he was alive. So, you know, I just wanted to bring forth three of these new African nationalists, black nationalists, that um, I feel that people need to go study and go look up. New African Tunis, G. Campbell. New African Benjamin Pap Singleton. New African Edwin P. McCabe. Remember those three names, because these cats are the, you know, work that we're continuing. That came, you know, the work we continue for as a new African nation. This is what the Republic of New Africa, you know, a couple of these cats are who our elders and ancestors are who we, you know, standing on. Including people like Gabriel Prosser, Cedar Gabriel Prosser which I am, then Mark Vesey, um, uh, and, and a couple of more, you know, cats who put it down, you know, struggling to get free, struggling to free this black colony that's been colonized here in the United States of America, man. Right? And the cats I'm going to talk about right now, I just need y'all to just go you know, do your homework on these cats because it wasn't just about Marcus Garvey. We we had, you know, a lot of people who, you know, was trying to get free and was trying to build a black nation and recognize that it was a black nation here in the United States of America. See, that's a lot of, you know, a lot of our, you know, people still under the colonization and the, you know, the mind wash of, you know, Western society and Western European education had you believed that and it got them still believing that we haven't done nothing which is false so this video right here is called nation builders new african nation builders the struggle is for land period and i just want to talk about a few cats y'all might not even know of might not even know of right now today because you know they don't talk about these type of people in western education or you know, these public schools around here. So you're going to have to teach these to your babies, you know, at home.
about these great men who were around and putting it down, you know. I just want to give a shout out to a couple of more other people that I'm not going to be able to get into today on this video, but I just want to, you know, get them honorable mentions like Martin Delaney, some call the father of black nationalism. He was one of the first, you know, cabans to get down for, you know, freeing the land. Martin Delaney, you know, Sali Muzalut to him. Um, Frank, you know, McWhorter of um, Illinois. He was the first African to found an African town or a town period by an African person in, in the United States of America. And he did this in Illinois. And it was called the New Philadelphia, Illinois town. Go look him up. Another great one. Who else I want to um, give honorable mentions to? Uh, you know, I can go on forever about the Maroon communities because the Maroon communities are some of our top combatants who was out here freeing the land. You know, setting up communities all across the United States of America, especially in the South particularly, you know, all the way down into the Caribbean islands, all the way down to South America. The Maroons, get them, I got to get them a big salute and a big solid move because they are nation builders. Um, and particularly, let me get into these real quick. Fort Moses, 1738. Go look that up. This is your first new African state in the West, you know, in the Western Hemisphere, before Haiti. Even though Haiti is the blueprint and the, you know the microcosm of freeing the land and a black nation, you know, we already know about Haiti. Sali Muzalu to Haiti, you know, the only Western Republic in the Western Hemisphere right now that's free. Well. You know, they got their own country and their own state, but, you know, they still, you know, being, you know, terrorized by Western imperialists and Western colonizers. So, you know, they're still in the struggle to have complete, you know, coming out that complete, you know, aftermath of the wars with the, you know, the French. So, you know, shout out to them, but go do your homework. Florida. Florida was the hub of nation building and blacks building stuff on their own in their own communities. So I want to give a shout out to Francisco Menendez, Chief Francisco Menendez, who was the chief of the military, all black military of Fort Mose in Florida. You know, first New African state. These people, you know, was was raising food for themselves on their own agriculture, cultivation. And, you know, they set up other settlements like shops, grocery stores. They had their own things at Fort Mose. So go look up Fort Mose. Um, the Negro Fort of the Black Seminoles. Go look that up. Where 1,800 Africans settled into this piece of land in Florida with the Seminole Nation, you know, with the indigenous native um, Seminoles. But these was the Black Seminoles who had their own fort called the Negro Fort. Go look up the Negro Fort where they settled there. Um, by this black man named Garcon. They don't really know his real name, but they just call him Black. Uh, they just call him Garcon. And um, him and a Choctaw chief, you know, um, from this Negro fort, man, they was putting it down, man. They was doing raids, crossing over into the United States, which their, you know, the United States borderline was Georgia and Florida at one time. And these cats, you know, because you know the indigenous peoples and the black peoples, you know, they was putting it down together down there in Florida. And these black Seminoles, led by, you know, this black man that got son, they was committing raids on the U.S. Army. From this Negro fort, and by them doing that, the Negro, um, the United States government, seen that these independent Black Africans, the Black Seminoles, were a threat to the United States. And by them being a state uh, threat to the United States, they they attacked this fort in July 27, 1816. 300 Africans murdered, killed by cannonballs, hovered over into the Negro fort. You see what I'm saying? And when they got in this fort, they found 2,500 muskets, 50 carbons, 400 pistols, 500 swords. You see what I'm saying? Protecting their land, protecting their fort, protecting their freedom, protecting the land. So I just wanted to give a shout out to those couple of people. They, you know, I might do a video on these these particular towns in another at another time, but I just wanted to, you know, mention them because a lot of y'all think, you know, 
it was just a couple of people who are out here, you know, fighting for, you know, to be an indep independent people. You know, man, we've been fighting for independence ever since we got here. And we've been putting it down ever since we got here, trying to free the land. So I just wanted to, you know, get a, you know, a big shout out to those, you know, ancestors. And, um, you know, may y'all spirits continue to walk with us, man, to try to free the land and try to free the black nation, which is the Republic of New Africa, the provisional government of Republic of New Africa. And, you know, shout out to all the nations, you know, that's here in the United States of America that's trying to get free. You see what I'm saying? Because it's, it's way more, you know, it's like San Yuka Shakur says, nations all through here, man, that's trying to get free. Even your brown, even our brown comrades, man. The ass Thailand. You see what I'm saying? If I'm saying that right, that's a nation within the nation of the United States of America who's fighting to get their land back. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, let me go ahead and get into it, man. This video is about Tunis G. Campbell, you know, Edwin P. McCabe, and Benjamin Pap Singleton, New African Nation Builders. And, and, and a big shout out to Solid Moo, out to Harry Haywood, who put it down for the Black Belt region, you know, making it, pushing this, you know, to our people, letting them know that the Black Belt is the black nation within the nation, which is runs from Virginia all the way to Florida, all the way back to Texas. Harry Haywood, go do your homework on New African communist Harry Haywood, a nation builder, black belt. Um, and shout out to W. Gurley, who started, you know, um, the Black Wall Street. You see what I'm saying? Another cat who put it down who was a nation builder. Shout out to W. Gurley, o. W. Gurley. go look him up. Go do some research on O. W. Gurley. Nation builders, New African nation builders, who built up the, you know, the biggest um, Black Wall Street, which was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Go look them up. Let me get on into this real quick. Let me first start off with Edwin, New African Edwin P. McCabe. McCabe. New African Edwin P. McCabe was a, um, first of all, He's dealing with Oklahoma and Kansas City, so y'all can you know understand the regions that he was putting it down in. Oklahoma, he came to he came to Kansas. He was born, I think he was born in New York. I'm not really um, sure, but I know he came to Kansas, and um, this is where he started his you know plan of you know freeing the land. You see what I'm saying? And um, New African Edwin P. McCabe, Oklahoma became a premier haven for African Americans moving westward from 1865 to 1920. By 1890, Oklahoma would claim over 137,000 African-American residents living in all black towns across Oklahoma. That's why I was telling y'all, if y'all been seeing me post over the last two years, y'all been seeing me always talking about Oklahoma. Oklahoma is known for the most black towns in that period of when we came up out of slavery and right before we came up out of slavery of some independent peoples. You see what I'm saying? By 1920, over 50 towns had been settled by African Americans seeking to escape the hardships and racial injustice so prevalent while living in the South after the Civil War, 1861 to 1865. These early settlers discovered they could open business, govern their own communities, vote, and own homes while living in peace and harmony. Recent re research has now brought to light several prominent early established black towns in Oklahoma. They included Langston, Oklahoma. When President Benjamin Harrison issued a proclamation stating that public lands in the Oklahoma district were open to settlers at noon on April 22, 1889, Edwin P. McCabe, an African American who served as a state auditor in Kansas for four years and as the state auditor in Oklahoma for 10 years decided to seize the moment of opportunity by purchasing 320 acres of land whereby the town of Langston, Oklahoma was established in 1890. He named the town after a congressman named John Mercer Langston or either it was Langston Taylor, 1820-1897, one of the first black congressmen in Virginia. He named the town after this. The first African-American congress, congressman elected from Virginia in 1888. During this period, also in this period of time, when when um 
Edwin McCabe when he um did these migrations from Kansas when he was still in Kansas but when he did these migrations before he did the migration trying to move Africans to Oklahoma he had a town in Kansas called Nicodemus Kansas and he had he was one of the first cats to come up with a strategic plan for Africans to do for themselves and to own land and this was called a five dollar plan and then what was the five dollar plan the five dollar plan was a fee that you could pay to obtain acres and a lot that you can build your own home on so he opened this up for Africans who were you know trying to have their own which you can go look this up he was selling acres of you know lots of land for African Americans to set up their own houses and to have their own land to do for themselves. It was called a five dollar, you know, fee for acres lots. And he did this to lure our people in so they can, you know, have their own. And by him doing that, a lot of, you know, African Americans, new Africans, you know, flocked to this. And so this was the beginning of him setting up what we call, you know, when this was Nicodemus. This was the black town of Nicodemus, which was prosperous. And um, it was a black self-sufficient on, you know, part of Kansas, a, 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 a town. I'm not really sure if it was a city yet, but it was a town. And um, this was one of his strategic tactics that he put down um, in that period of time in Kansas. I mean, these cats, man. I'm trying to tell you, man. And you got to get influence off this, man. You got this is self determination that I'm speaking about right here. Like these people came out of slavery. A lot of these people wasn't free people, man. These was slaves that built up their own on their own. Let me let me run down some more on Edward. Edward P. McCabe. This is this is biography. Um, was a new was an African American politician, a businessman most notable for his promotion of black settlement in Oklahoma and Kansas. Born in 1850 in Troy, New York, McCabe would attend school until his father's death when he left school to support his family as a clerk on Wall Street in 1872. He earned, he earned as a job as a clerk in Chicago. Two years later, McCabe left Chicago for Kansas and arrived in, arrived in a growing black community of Nicodemus in 1878. In Nicodemus, McCabe established himself as an attorney and land agent. When Graham County was established in 1880, McCabe was appointed temporary clerk and officially elected as a county clerk. The next year, in 1882, he successfully stood as the Republican candidate for state auditor, a victory which made him the most important black office holder outside of the South. However, as Nicodemus' fortunes reversed and the town began to hemorrhage, Residents, McCabe left first for Washington, then for Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, the number of blacks involved in the land rush, this was called the land rush, as the territory opened up to non Indian settlements in 1889, led McCabe to realize the potential of new territory, both as a haven for racism, both as a haven from racism, and as a potential source of personal acclaim and profit for himself. He purchased 320 acres established Langston City, named for a recently elected black congressman, hired agents to travel to the South to attract new settlers. McCabe promised through these agents that the new settlers would, would be coming to the paradise of Eden in the Garden of Gods and capitalize on the rapidly deteriorating conditions in the South, Oregon. Here the Negro can rest from the mob law. Here he can be secure from every ill of the Southern policies. The recruitment campaign was success by 1891. The town had over 200 residents. Langston City was part of McCabe's larger political ambitions. He hoped that the broad African American settlement in the Oklahoma Territory would catapult him into the governor's office. This prospect was greeted with excitement by the black press and was condemned by white, condemned by white and Native Americans. While McCabe was successful in promoting and inspiring all black towns of Oklahoma between 1890. In 1910, 30 new all-black towns would be established. He would fall short of his political goals. He would never be governor. 
and soon after the Oklahoma was accepted into the Union in 1907, the state legislature would pass transportation segregation legislation. McCabe would challenge the law in court, selling his Oklahoma home in the process to pay legal fees, only to have it upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1914. Edward McCabe died in Chicago in 1920 and was buried in Topeka, Kansas. So salute and solid move to Edward P. McCabe, man. Moving right on along to one of my favorites, New African, Benjamin Papp Singleton. This man is known for the exodus in North America. Like he has, this man is known for moving the most slaves into a freedom far as land, I, I have to say, in history of the United States of America, period. Nobody did it like Benjamin Papp Singleton, man. Let me go ahead and run down some history about Benjamin Papp Singleton. Benjamin Papp Singleton was an American activist, businessman, best known for his role in establishing African-American settlements in Kansas. A former slave from Tennessee who escaped to freedom in 1846, he became a noted abolitionist, community leader, and a spokesman for African-American civil rights. He returned to Tennessee during the Union occupation in 1862, but soon, but soon concluded that blacks would never achieve economic equality in a white-dominated South. After the end of Reconstruction, Singleton organized the movement of thousands of new African black nationalists, known as the Exodusters, to found settlements in Kansas. A prominent voice for early black nationalism, he became involved in promoting, coordinating black-owned businesses in Kansas and developed an interest in the Back to Africa movement. His Back to Africa movement, well, I go ahead and throw this in here, this was at the end of what he tried to do as far as moving all, after he moved all those Africans from the South to the Western, you know, colonies and the Western lands of Kansas. Kansas wasn't known as the South, it was known as West then. So he moved a major amount of slaves to freedom into their own lands and buying their own lands, you know, occupying their own lands into the western and into Kansas. But his, um, when all things, you know, when it was coming down to the end of his, you know, time, he wanted to get into the Back to Africa movement because, um, like all the things that happened in New African people in history, stuff just started to deteriorate. You see what I'm saying? Whether it came from hating ass, you know, European Americans who hated on our uh, people for wanting to be, you know, independent and doing for ourselves, or we just couldn't sustain it. You see what I'm saying? This is what happened to most of all these, you know, you know, independent towns and communities that we set up back then, man. Before and when we came out of slavery. Moving right along. Separatism. After the Union Army occupied Middle Tennessee in 1862, Singleton returned and took up residence in Nashville, Tennessee, and worked as a cabinet maker and coffee maker. The experience of the freemen subject to racial violence and political problems led Singleton to conclude that blacks would have no chance for equality in the South. Disgusted by political leaders who failed to live on promises for equality and for freedom, in 1869, joined forces with Columbus M. Johnson, a black minister in summer county and began looking for ways to establish black economic independence. In 1874, Singleton and Johnson had founded the Edgefield, the hold on, Edgefield Real Estate Association with goal of helping African Americans obtain land in Nashville area. Unfortunately, white landowners were unwilling to bargain with them and wanted too high prices for their land. Convinced that free men must lead the South to achieve true economic independence, in 1875, Singleton began to explore the idea of planting black colonies in the American West. His real estate organization was renamed the Edgefield Real Estate and Homestead Association. In 1876, Singleton Johnson traveled to Kansas to scout the land in Cherokee County in the southeastern corner of the state. Hardened by what he saw, Singleton returned to Nashville and began recruiting settlers for a proposed colony. Let me move right on down to the major the Exodusters. The Exodusters. This is between the period of 1879. No, yeah, from 1879 to 1880. Check this history out. Some dope history. By a nation builder. 
by 1879, the Great Exodus, 50,000. Listen to that number, man. 50,000 freemen known as Exodusters had migrated from the South to escape poverty and racial violence following whites regaining political uh, you know, political control across the former Confederacy. They migrated to Kansas, Missouri, Indiana, Illinois, seeking land, better working conditions, and a chance to live in peace. Part of Topeka, Kansas was known as Tennessee Town because of many migrants from the state that most had no direct connection with Singleton's organized colony movement. But Singleton and his followers were sympathetic to their plight. Many white Kansans began to object to rival so many desperately poor blacks in their state. Singleton stepped forward to defend the Exodusters' right to try to make better lives in the American West. In 1880, Singleton was requested to appear before the United States Senate in Washington, D.C. to testify on the causes of the great exodus to Kansas. Singleton rebuffed the efforts of the Southern Senators to discredit the exodus movement. He testified to his own success of setting up independent black colonies and noted that the terrible conditions which caused freedmen to lead the South. Singleton returned to Kansas as a nationally recognized spokesman for the exodusters. Unfortunately, arrivals so many poor blacks put more of the financial burden on Dunlap, on the Dunlap colony than the original settlers could bear. By 1880, the Presbyterian Church had taken charitable control of the settlement and made plans to build Freedmen Academies in the town. Singleton had no more dealings with his colony at Dunlop. In 1881, Benjamin P. Sing uh, Benjamin Pap Singleton was 72 years old, and most people referred to him affectionately as Old Pap. He was still a, photo, a, a formidable figure and used his reputation to bring together blacks into an organization called the Colored United Links. The goal of the CUL, which he created in Topeka, Kansas, was to combine the financial resources of all black people to build black-owned businesses, factories, and trade schools. The CUL formed in 1881 held several conventions. The, organizers, the organization was successful enough locally that the Republican Party officials of Kansas became interested in its potential political strength. President candidate James B. Weaver, a greenback, party met with CUL leaders to discuss fusion between the two groups. After 1881, CUL memberships faltered. However, the organization soon fell all apart. After the failure of the CUL, Singleton became convinced that blacks would never be allowed to succeed in the United States. In 1883, Singleton briefly joined with St. Louis, Missouri businessman Joseph Ware and black minister John Williams in proposing that blacks migrate to the Mediterranean island of Cyprus. That idea did not develop. In 1885, Singleton moved to Kansas City where he began to organize around Pan-Africanism. In 1885, Singleton founded the United Transatlantic Society with the goal of having all blacks re relocate from the United States to Africa. See, this, this is before Marcus Garvey. You see what I'm saying? So this is why y'all need to get up on y'all history, man. This was a time when Bishop Henry McNeil Turner had his own proposed African migration movement. The UTS lasted to 1887, but never managed to send anyone to Africa. In poor health, Singleton retired from his life of activism. He raised his voice one final time in 1889 to call for a portion of the newly opened Oklahoma Territory to be reserved as an all-black state. Benjamin Singleton died on February 17, 1900 in Kansas City, Missouri. He was buried in the Union Cemetery in Kansas City, Missouri on February 26, 1900. Sally Moo to, you know, salute to, you know, Benjamin Papp Singleton, new African nation builder. This was before Marcus Garvey when Benjamin Papp did this. So this is why it's important to you to learn about these people because, like I told you, Marcus Garvey wasn't the only one putting it down. Now let me come down to this, before I shut the video, come down to one of my favorite new African nationalists to ever put it down. And, you know, I love this cat right here. Cause he's one of the main cats that you know the Republic of New Africa we 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 deem as one of our you know first nationalists to put it down to free the land you know so let me get into this New African so, um Tunis G Campbell the struggles for land abandoned lands special field order 15 RBG Black Academics New African History 365 cultivating Liberty, activist, New African, Tunis G. Campbell, 
and former slaves start self-sufficient, self-determination lives in Georgia. Even as Robert Lee, this is the, this is a little something about um the history of what you know Tony G. Campbell did. This was around the time around the time of Robert E. Lee and them. Even as Lee surrendered to Grant, scores of newly emancipated men and women were arriving at St. Catharines in the Sea Islands of Georgia. Under Sherman's field order 15, these abandoned lands would be theirs. Tony G. Campbell from New Jersey. For years, Campbell had worked tireless as an abolitionist, as an abolitionist, a preacher, an educator, and a political organizer. With the help of the Secretary of War, Stan Campbell got himself appointed superintendent for the Union Occupied Islands in Georgia. There were a lot of people in 1865 who were trying to tell blacks what freedom is and tell them what they ought to be doing. Campbell reflects the impulse. We should really determine ourselves what, what we're doing. Independence from white control. That's critical to their definition of what freedom is. It's just happened that on the St. Catherine Islands you can create such a thing. The whites have all fled. Sherman has given our land. So the opportunity to create independent black community exists. We left with rations and a few families at the Hilton. Head got more. Campbell wrote. And Savannah loaded us as deep as we could swim. These deserted lands had been at the heart of the South rice growing empire. As Campbell arrived to the island and they put the gangplank down, the island was overgrown. It's been low. It's been looted by Union naval forces. The sea grass is high. There are rattlesnakes. There are alligators. He can see the slave cabins. They are also in they are also in great dis disrepair. Immediately upon arriving and assessing the situation there, he writes to the American Missionary Association, asking for seeds, asking for plows, sweet potatoes, to supplement the diet, marriage marriage licenses for the people, and he calls a meeting of the people to explain to them, "This is our home." Beginning next week, I would divide up the land into 40 acres for each of you. By June, the settlers had crops in the ground. I have corn, watermelon, citron, onions, radishes, and squash, wrote Campbell. But the rebels have destroyed the sweet potatoes. Do not fail to send them. Send eight number 11 plows, six cultivators. Get the improved ones. Part two. Tunis G. Campbell, part two. Tunis Campbell sees the South as a kind of a new political frontier. He sees himself as a kind of political pioneer to go to that place where this new regime of black political liberty and civil liberty might flourish. Tunis G. Campbell ride at St. Catharines with his own blueprint for a black government. There would be a a Congress with eight men in the Senate and 20 in the House of Representatives, a Supreme Court, and Campbell himself as president. He even established a 275-man militia. Order, said Campbell, is heaven's first law. So if you got this tiny little island, 12 miles long, 3 miles wide, and a government set up to resemble the United States government with a Supreme Court at the top, it's wonderful, it's beautiful experiment in democracy and people took it in very well. They liked the idea of having the power to select their own leaders and remove them. Tunis G. Campbell, New African. The St. Captain Islands and this islands was off of the coast of Georgia and the special field order 15 was an order that was given out by the um, Union General Richard Sherman. I'm not Richard Sherman, but Sherman, General Sherman. And this was an order that he put out because he had so many slaves trying to get free. So they, when they was trying to get free, they was following the Union Army all through Georgia, you know, because this was they, they seen this as their break to get free. And so they brought in Tunis G. Campbell to set up this order and set up this nation and to give these free blacks somewhere to live because they had nowhere to live.
because they was running out. They was trying to get away from the Confederates, the Confederate slave owners and the Confederate, you know, control and slave control. So they followed um, Sherman all the way to the islands that's off the coast of Georgia. And what the special field order 15 is, was a land from Georgia, the islands off of Georgia, all the way up the coast to like up into South Carolina. This was supposed to have been a black nation. You see what I'm saying? This is where Tunis G. Campbell was going to set up the black nation on the coast of Georgia and South Carolina, on these islands up the coast. The thing about it, it never happened because the United States government, which Richard, well, I mean, where, where I, I hate to keep saying Richard Sherman, but General Sherman, um, United States, he went, General Sherman left this in the hands of the United States. And he told the United States, because the United States government asked him, did he want to really, you know, get these people this land? And being the racist that Sherman, Sherman was, which he was a racist on the low low, he left it up to the United States government. And the United States government didn't give, didn't give, you know, what they promised, which is what they call the 40 acres and the mule. This is where the 40 acres and the mule come from. It comes from the special ill, the special order 15. Go look that up. And you, I'm telling you, if you go look up all this information, you're going to understand the state of new African and black people here in the United States government today and why, you know, most of us in these black liberation organizations and these, you know, organizations who are trying to fight for our freedom and fight for land and trying to get free because land is the basis of freedom and independence, period. You see what I'm saying? And we are owed this. Just like we are owed reparations for our ancestors for working for free. You see what I'm saying? Special Field Order 15 proves that. 40 Acres and the Mule proves that. We're owed land. And the Republican New Africans specifically, when, when, when that provisional government was brought into existence by Amari Obadeli and the Obadeli brothers and 500 other New African nationalists, you see what I'm saying? These are the people that they look back on to continue their struggle. Tonis G. Campbell, Benjamin Pap Singleton, Edward P. McCabe, and people like O.W. Gurley, and the list just goes on, man. William Brown of Richmond, Virginia, the list just goes on on nation builders. So I just want y'all to go do y'all history on these people that I just brought forth to you today. And I'm gonna sign this video off right here. This has been the video, New African Nation Builders. The struggle is for land, free to land. Hockey Quiddish Accord, see the Gabriel Prosser rebuild.